The Clone Wars devastated many of the galaxy's planets. The Separatists deployed their droid army to ravage Republic worlds, leaving millions dead or without homes. They had a wide array of weapons at their disposal, and one of their most terrifying weapons was the HMP droid gunship. That's the key word, terrifying. This gunship did far more than devastate Republic worlds. Sometimes it was turned on the Separatists' own citizens with frightening effectiveness. In today's video, we'll discuss the HMP droid gunship, focusing on its specs and how Separatist dictators used it to keep their populace in line. The HMP droid gunship, short for Heavy Missile Platform, was a repulsor lift air speed arm manufactured by Bactoid Fleet Ordnance for the Confederacy of Independent Systems near the end of the Clone Wars. It was based on the older design of the mechanized assault flyer and intended for low altitude airstrikes. The droid gunship was the Separatists' answer to the Grand Army of the Republic's Low Altitude Assault Transport or Infantry Gunships. This behemoth of an airspeeder measured 12.46 meters or 41 feet long, 9.75 meters or 32 feet wide, and 2.78 meters or 9 feet tall. Its creators saw it as a hunk of heavily shielded metal capable of raining pain upon its enemies at a speed of up to 100 kilometers or 62 miles per hour. Much like its predecessor, it had a saucer-shaped body and a reactor and drive system mounted in the center of its domed hull. In front, it featured a scorpion-like head with glowing red eyes and moving mandibles. Unlike its predecessor, the vehicle was unmanned, controlled by an integrated droid brain linked to a droid control ship in orbit. Although the ship was relatively slow and clunky, it was armed to the teeth and not afraid to spend its arsenal. Most of the ship's energy-based weapons were mounted on its head. They included a forward-mounted heavy laser cannon and two forward-mounted spherical turrets housing twin light laser cannons. Two medium laser cannons were also mounted on small S-foils on the ship's flanks. But that wasn't all the gunship's firepower. On the surface of its main body, Bactoid fitted modular ordnance racks that could deploy any type of projectile in the Separatists' arsenal. Concussion missiles, torpedoes, electromagnetic pulse bombs, the gunship could fire them all. And if that wasn't enough, some models were custom fitted with deployment racks for B1, B2 and BX series battle droids. As we mentioned earlier, however, this ship wasn't particularly fast. To substitute its low speed and maneuverability, Bactoid equipped it with a powerful ray shield generator that could protect it from enemy blaster fire. Short range sensors rounded out the ship's defenses, giving it a fighting chance even against faster Republic speeders. It was a fantastic, reliable craft designed for air support in planetary atmospheres, and the Separatist army put it to good use. Sometimes that meant targeting their own people. One of the problems with war is that it's never just between opposing factions. Wartime gives bad people an opportunity to do bad things, and this is as true in the Star Wars universe as it is in ours. During the Clone Wars, many world leaders took advantage of the conflict and allied with the CIS, leveraging their planet's shipyards and resources to tighten their hold on the people they had subjugated. Addo Emon was an excellent example of a bad man made worse by war. During the Clone Wars, he was the ruler of the planet Karam V in the Mid-Rim, and was known for his silver tongue. Although the planet initially took a neutral stance in the war, Emon secretly forged an alliance with the CIS and offered Krem 5s vast manufacturing facilities in exchange for a percentage of the ships produced. The Separatists were quite happy with this arrangement. They got an armada of HMP droid gunships, and Emon got his cut of the fleet. Remember how the droid gunship was intended for airstrikes in planetary atmospheres? Emon did. He deployed his new fleet against his own people, turning his rule into a dictatorship the planet would not soon forget. The gunships targeted anyone Eamon perceived as a threat to his rule, but the thing with heavy ordnance is that it's rather indiscriminate when deployed in urban centers. Eamon killed anyone and anything that may have come to stand against him, but he also killed innocents and ravaged the land. At least the ships he gave the Separatists had his shiny, triple spiraled insignia to show that he was a charitable CIS sponsor. The people of Karam 5 greatly appreciated the free advertisement. Eamon wasn't the only leader to deploy gunships against his own world. In fact, he wasn't even the worst. That title goes to King Sanjay Rash of the Royal Court of Onderon. 
When the Clone Wars began, Onderon's ruler, King Ramses Stendup, chose to remain neutral despite some members of his cabinet approving the CIS's leader, Count Dooku. Onderon's location in the Inner Rim was perfect for launching armadas into the galaxy, so the Separatists chose to respect the king's decision, peacefully invading the capital city Aziz and occupying the planet with their droid army, replacing the legitimate ruler with a Separatist sympathizer named Sanjay Rash. The people of Onderon didn't take kindly to the occupation, nor to their new dictator's harsh regime. It didn't take long for a group of rebels to organize a resistance force in the jungle. For two years, the rebels did their best to fight the droid army, but they lacked training and supplies. In what must have felt like their last hope, they reached out to the Jedi Council. After long deliberation, the Council agreed to train the resistance, even though some believed it was an internal affair the Jedi shouldn't involve themselves in. Thus, Anakin Skywalker, Ahsoka Tano, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Captain Rex left for the planet. On Onderon, the Republic team taught the rebels how to take out various models of battle droids from droidikas to AATs. Under their tutelage, the rebels, which included then newbie Saw Gerrera, defended their camp from the droid army and carried out strikes against the droid capital. They even destroyed the main generator that powered the Separatist droids. The illegitimate king grew increasingly concerned with the rebels' success. He received additional support from the Separatists in the form of General Kalani, a super tactical droid. Believing the former king to be behind the rebels' activity, Rash planned his public execution. In the end, the execution failed when the royal guard sided with the rebels and freed the king. This is where the droid gunships come in. Now enraged, King Rash and General Kalani sent in the droid army in an all-out attack to wipe out the new rebel camp in the highlands. Several HMP droid gunships were deployed. Even though the rebels fought off the droid army's ground forces, the gunships were far too powerful, forcing them to retreat. Fortunately for the Rebels, Skywalker went to Florum to secure rocket launchers, which he brought back to Onderon. These proved effective against the gunships devastating the area. Unfortunately for the Seps, one gunship crashed into the side of the mountain where Steeler Guerrera was standing and she fell to her death. This seemingly insignificant death would cause both the Separatists and the Empire a lot of grief later on, as it radicalized Saw Guerrera, her brother, and essentially turned him into a straight up terrorist. Despite heavy losses, the rebels won. Count Dooku ordered the droid army to withdraw from the planet, which displeased the dictator. When he insisted on additional reinforcements, the droids smoked him and withdrew from the planet completely. In the aftermath, the former king was reinstated as Onderon's ruler and the planet joined the Republic. Few would soon forget the terror of the droid army's occupation, however, and the reign of destruction the HMP droid gunships brought down on Onderon civilians. Even after the Clone Wars, the HMP droid gunship still saw use, including in the Battle of Mustafar. But battles are never as devastating as attacks on civilian populations, especially when they're upon one's own people. War is war, and terror is indiscriminate. The Vulture Droid is one of the most recognizable starfighters in Star Wars, as iconic in the prequels as the TIE Fighter is in the original trilogy. These small but deadly droid craft were used extensively by the Trade Federation and later the Confederacy of Independent Systems, always deployed in vast swarms against Republic pilots. Based on their depiction in the films and especially in Star Wars The Clone Wars, you might think Vulture Droids were mere cannon fodder, the TIE Fighters of their day. If so, you're selling these fighters short. The Vulture Droid was actually one of the most brilliant Starfighter designs in the Star Wars universe and in this video, we'll tell you why. Officially, the Variable Geometry Self-Propelled Battle Droid Mark I, the Vulture Droid, was the product of Haor Chal Engineering, a Shi Cha company based on Charos IV. The Shi Cha were a bit of an eccentric species. They were intensely religious, and at the core of their religion was the pursuit of perfection. The Shi Cha sought perfection by making or improving things, with the most common form of religious practice on Charos IV being precision manufacturing. These zealots made a lot of stuff, but their speciality was starfighters, which they designed and built in vast cathedral factories. Their products typically put those of their competitors to shame. Howard Charles engineers considered the Vulture Droid to be their magnum opus. One of the most highly valued traits of Shichar products was their ability to transform, a rare feature that held great religious significance for the species. 
The Vulture Droid was one of the most successful examples of the Shi Cha's so-called variable geometry craft. In other words, its wings could reorient to serve as legs, allowing these droid starfighters to walk when they weren't in flight. The Vulture Droid was originally designed for the Trade Federation and service in the Trade Federation Defense Force's new droid army. Prior to the Vulture Droid's introduction, the Trade Federation relied on more generic starfighters piloted by battle droids which were notoriously ineffective. Their new droid starfighters could cut out the middlemen and ended up proving to be far more effective than any fighter craft the Trade Federation had ever used before. The Vulture Droid remained a key component of the Trade Federation's arsenal for as long as the company existed, participating in the Battle of Naboo and many lesser engagements. During the Clone Wars, the Vulture Droid was adopted as the primary interceptor of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, largely replacing the starfighters used by other Separatist Council factions. The CIS Navy deployed them in vast swarms, which numbered in the tens of thousands in larger battles. These adaptable craft served the Confederacy's interceptors, air support, and even anti-personnel platforms, fighting from the First Battle of Geonosis to the Battle of Coruscant. The Vulture Droid was extraordinarily compact. In fighter mode, it was roughly 3.5 meters in both width and length, with the empty space between their wingtips making up much of that length. The main body of the Vulture Droid was only lightly armored, sheathed in a non-magnetic Alclad alloy, and was mostly dedicated to the craft's two ion engines. The craft's droid brain, transmitter arrays, and most of its sensors were located in a bullet-shaped head which could extend out from the main body along a thin, stalk-like neck. Most of the Vulture Droid's target profile was formed by its four blade-like wings, the most well-armored part of the craft, which contained the droid's repulsor lifts and primary weapons array. Due to its small size, the Vulture Droid was rather fragile, especially when compared with starfighters used by the Republic. It had no shields and only light armor. However, the Vulture Droid made up for this with sheer speed. These bad boys were unimaginably fast, capable of flying at over a thousand kilometers per hour in atmosphere and at speeds of several thousand Gs in outer space. In the real world, human pilots can only survive nine Gs. In the Star Wars universe, Tensor fields allowed them to survive much more, but Vulture Droids moved so fast and could change direction so rapidly that not even the best Tensor fields could keep a human from splattering all over their seat. Vulture Droids didn't need shields or armor, they were designed to be too fast to hit. Speed wasn't the Vulture Droids only asset though, it was also heavily armed for such a small fighter. Each Vulture Droid had a light laser cannon per wing, totaling 4 cannons per craft. These weren't the most powerful guns in the market, but they could fire at high speeds and could quickly wear down Starfighter shields. The main body of the Vulture Droid also featured a pair of energy torpedo launchers which could be swapped out for more laser cannons. In either configuration, these could also do serious damage to a target. As if all that array of weapons wasn't formidable enough, Vulture Droids could also carry missiles, with one mounted on each wingtip. Usually, they carried concussion missiles, but they were also known to use their missile launchers to deploy buzz droids. As a starfighter, the Vulture Droid wasn't without its weaknesses. It wasn't the smartest droid in the Confederacy, and enemy pilots who survived first contact with these nimble menaces quickly discovered that their combat maneuvers were basic and repetitive. A much less well-known weakness was the unusual fuel system on which the Vulture Droids relied. These droids were powered by weird solid fuel slugs which could only power the craft in combat mode for a little over half an hour. Once that time was up, Vulture Droids had to return to their carriers to refuel. The Trade Federation made up for this weakness by sending the droids out in staggered swarms, ensuring there were always hundreds in action at any given time. But this weakness could nonetheless be exploited by cunning tacticians. Of course, with all that said, the Vulture Droid was an amazing starfighter. On its own, it was remarkably hard to pin down and quite good at outmaneuvering and shredding enemy pilots. But one of the Vulture's greatest assets was that it was never on its own. These bad boys came not in squadrons, but in swarms, with each Lucra Hulk class battleship carrying 1500. It doesn't matter how good a pilot or their fighter was, nobody short of Anakin Skywalker could last as long against that many Vultures. To make matters worse, Vulture droids were usually coordinated from droid control ships, which gave these massive swarms incredible coordination. 
A properly coordinated swarm of these bloodthirsty droid fighters could shred a squadron of clone pilots in seconds. But the Vulture Droid wasn't just a kick-ass starfighter. Its wings could change configuration, transforming it from a starfighter into a light walker. Since this conserved fuel, and since it was faster to launch from walker mode than from a maintenance rack, Vultures often did this while awaiting combat, allowing them to deploy extremely quickly. Vulture droids in walker mode were often used to patrol hangars or spaceports. During the Clone Wars, the Separatists often had vultures crawl around on the surface of their warships, which gave the warships extra protection. General Grievous often had the Invisible Hand's vulture droid complement patrol the hull in this manner, allowing the fighters to respond to surprise attacks while tri-fighters were scrambled in the main hangar. The Separatists also took advantage of the Vulture Droid's walking abilities to assign squadrons to warships that usually didn't have hangars, such as the Munificent Class Star Frigate and Recusant Class Light Destroyer. Like bats in the rafters of a great hall, these Vulture Droids would gather along the support beams that held up the distinctive carapace-like armor sheaths of the warships, magnetically attaching themselves to the interior for travel through hyperspace. In walker configuration, the Vulture Droid was a force to be reckoned with. All of its wingtip mounted weapons were unusable in this configuration, but its energy torpedo launchers were not, and the droids could use them as devastating anti-personnel weapons. In its walker form, the vulture droid went from being a fragile, barebone starfighter to the equivalent of a beefed up ATRT, able to wipe out entire squads of hostile infantry. Encounters with grounded vulture droids weren't too common for your average clone, since most commanders preferred to keep their vultures in the air or patrolling hangars and spaceports. But when they did come into contact, it usually didn't end well. Only one starfighter, in our opinion, could give the vulture droid a run for its money, the droid Tri-Fighter, the most feared separatist fighter of all. But it's a close contest. The Tri-Fighter was definitely a better starfighter, but it wasn't nearly as versatile as the vulture droid, and it was a good deal more expensive as well. It's a tie as far as we're concerned. In a recent video, we talked about why the Vulture Droid was one of the best starfighters in Star Wars because it could perform maneuvers no living pilot could withstand. In that video, we said that only one starfighter was superior to the Vulture Droid. This was the Tri-Fighter, which served alongside the Vulture late in the Clone Wars. The Tri-Fighter wasn't quite as flashy as the Vulture Droid and it didn't have as much utility, but it was the ultimate starfighter, the terror of Republic fighter squadrons all over the galaxy. In this video, we'll be explaining why. Like the infamous Droidica, the Tri-Fighter was a Colicoid product. The Colicoid creation nest designed the Tri-Fighter, and it was then produced in vast numbers by Collar Designs and Flak Aproc Automata Industries. Like with the Droidica, the Tri-Fighter's design might have seemed extremely alien to human eyes, but to any Colicoid, it was familiar. Just as the Droidicas were modelled on the Colicoids themselves, the Tri-Fighter was based on the skull of a huge, fearsome predator that terrorised the wilds of Colour 4. To the Colicoids, the silhouette of the Tri-Fighter was a symbol of terror and death. It didn't take long for it to mean the same thing to Republic pilots. The introduction of the Tri-Fighter was a rare shake-up for the Confederate Navy's fighter wings. While the Republic Navy's Starfighter Corps went through half a dozen Starfighter designs over the years, trying to find a fighter that could match the ferocious Vulture Droid, the Confederacy typically stuck to its guns, solving all of its fighter-related problems by simply deploying more Vultures. As we mentioned in our earlier video, the CIS already had the best Starfighters in the galaxy when the war started, so it didn't need to innovate much. However, that didn't stop Separatist leaders from commissioning the Colicoids to design the ultimate Starfighter, and the Tri-Fighter was the result. Unlike many of the Republic's new fighters, which usually replaced older models in Republic battle formations, the Tri-Fighter was meant to be deployed alongside the Vulture Droid, which would remain the mainstay of Separatist fighter wings. Unlike the Generalist Vulture Droid, which could act in a variety of combat roles, the Tri-Fighter was a specialist, built solely for dogfighting. The two complemented each other well. During the later years of the Clone Wars, swarms of Vulture Droids would act as the primary method of force projection for Separatist carrier battleships, while Tri-Fighter squadrons escorting them would take out any pesky clone pilots that got in their way. They were devastatingly effective at this. The Republic Starfighter Corps had enough trouble just trying to match the Vulture Droid. 
With the deployment of the Tri-Fighter, the battlefield became a nightmare for clone pilots. The Tri-Fighter was a marvel of engineering. The droid's main reactor was located in a heavily armoured gyroscoping core at the centre of the craft, which also contained communications transceivers that allowed it to keep a constant fix on its mothership. This central reactor was linked to a trio of powerful thrusters, each with its own ionisation reactor, as well as secondary accelerators that could subtly alter the direction of thrust independently for each thruster, granting the Tri-Fighter spectacular mobility and control even at extremely high speeds. In space, these craft had a maximum acceleration of 3600 g, with a maximum speed in atmosphere of over 1000 km per hour. The Tri-Fighter, like the Vulture Droid, was a droid in its own right, piloted by a highly sophisticated droid brain. The brain was located in front of the reactor bulb between a pair of large photoreceptors. Between the droid brain and the reactor, three arches looped around the reactor bulb, forming the Tri-Fighter's iconic silhouette. These arches contained the droid's fuel tanks and fuel injection systems near the rear, while the Tri-Fighter's power cells lined the inner side of the arch. Radiator fins between the three engines contained heat sinks, while the middle part of each arch featured an exposed section from which excess radiation could be safely discharged, completing the Tri-Fighter's propulsion systems. While the aft half of the Tri-Fighter was almost exclusively given over to propulsion, weapon systems dominated the front half of the craft. The front halves of its three arches contained power feeds and capacitators for the droid's secondary laser cannons, as well as repulsor lifts and secondary sensors. The droid's main laser cannon emerged from the droid brain's housing at the front of the craft, and ingeniously, the colloids had shaped the Tri-Fighter's brain as a sort of donut shape, with the capacitators for the primary laser cannon running right through the middle. All told, the Tri-Fighter was extremely compact, a mere 5.4 meters in length, featuring little more than propulsion systems and guns. Despite its size, however, it was deceptively resilient. The Tri-Fighter was heavily armoured for its size, far more than the Vulture Droid, and it had no real weak spots, with its armour consistent pretty much all over. The Tri-Fighter had no shields, but between its speed and its tiny target profile, it didn't really need them. Of course, a Starfighter isn't a Starfighter without weapons, and the Tri-Fighter was quite well armed. Its main weapon was its nose-mounted heavy laser cannon, from which a single well-placed shot could take out an ARC-170. It also had a light laser cannon on each wingtip, and these had extremely high rates of fire. The Tri-Fighter's various laser cannons could fire independently, all at once, or in staggered pattern meant to disorient opponents. The wingtip cannons could also tilt their rails for greater accuracy. When all firing at once, the Tri-Fighter's guns created a deadly field of fire that few pilots could escape. This arrangement was made even more lethal by the Tri-Fighter's tendency to spin in battle turning its field of fire into a whirling cone of death. Tri-Fighters also featured underslung racks for 2-6 missiles, typically concussion missiles or discord missiles, which deployed swarms of infamously chaotic buzz droids. These missiles were designed for use against other Starfighters, though presumably they could be deployed against capital ships as well. The Tri-Fighter was said to have been deployed for the first time in 21 BBY, but there are accounts of them fighting in swarms in the Battle of Praesitlan in 22 BBY. They participated in the Battle of Celust, the Battle of Belderone, and the Battle of Coruscant, slaughtering whole squadrons of clone pilots every time the clones appeared. At Celust, a few squadrons of Tri-Fighters even managed to take out an entire Star Destroyer, the Venator class Resolute, with a little guidance from Asajj Ventress. The various aforementioned strengths of the Tri-Fighter, its high speed and maneuverability, its armor and small target profile, and its unusually heavy firepower made it hard to kill and hard to flee. Small packs of Tri-Fighters could pick apart clone Starfighter squadrons in games of divide and conquer. Even if this tactic was unsuccessful in wiping out an enemy squadron, it typically scattered the squadron enough to throw the course of a fighter battle in the Separatist's favor. The only Republic Starfighter that stood a chance of outmaneuvering these cunning craft was the ETA-2 Actus-class Interceptor, a fighter usually reserved for Jedi deployed near the end of the war. The ETA-2 was nowhere near as well armed or armoured as the Tri-Fighter however, so it was usually at a disadvantage when up against them. 
even famed Jedi pilots struggled against the TIE Fighter. Saisi Tin, the second best pilot in the Jedi Order, was nearly killed when three TIE Fighters ganged up on him during the Outer Rim sieges. Only the timely intervention of the Order's number one pilot, Anakin Skywalker, saved him from an untimely doom. Many other Republic aces weren't so lucky. TIE Fighters were designed for dogfighting and they were relentless, often picking a target and doggedly pursuing it until either it was destroyed or the TIE Fighter was. There was no Starfighter better than the TIE Fighter. The Colicoids designed a craft that not only took full advantage of automated Starfighters, but also eliminated all remnants of traditional fighter design, allowing for an extraordinarily efficient, compact and alien craft. It was the ultimate interceptor, and it was only through sheer luck or the force that any Republic pilot survived a dogfight with one. Unfortunately, post-Clone Wars factions learned absolutely nothing from this ingenious design, stubbornly continuing to rely on meatbag piloted aircraft instead of fighters piloted by droids. Of all the tank droids that fought in the Battle of Geonosis, the Hellfire droid may well be the most memorable. These fast-moving, hoop-wheeled missile tanks proved incredibly effective against the Republic ATTEs in that first Battle of the Clone Wars, as any Star Wars fan could surely tell you. But despite the ease with which these droids annihilated one of the Republic's most effective heavy vehicles, they weren't used all that much during the Clone Wars. In fact, after the first few months of the conflict, they disappeared all but entirely, and they didn't make a return to the front lines until the very end. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Howfire droid and discussing why they were pulled from the front lines. Produced by Hat or Charl Engineering, the designers of the infamous Vulture droid, the IG-227 Howfire class droid tank was developed in the years before the Clone Wars for the Intergalactic Banking Clan. Under the IGBC's Collections and Security Division, they were typically employed to back up the banking clan's debt collectors. In the last centuries of the Republic, the IGBC had started to repossess entire planets that defaulted on their loans. The HAL Fire Droid quickly became one of their favourite tools for doing so, as it was not only effective, but also quite intimidating. The HAL Fire Droid had a bit of an unusual design, as with most of Xi Char products. Its defining feature was its twin hoop-like drive wheels, which allowed the droid to operate on virtually any terrain at speeds of up to 45 km an hour. The rest of the droid was relatively compact. Its well-armored main reactor and droid brain, as well as its weapons, were all crammed into a small central body. The thin hoop-like design of all its wheels and its small body made the Howl Fire droid a difficult target to hit. Small arms fire was all but useless against the Hellfire droid, which was armoured well despite its compact design. Its only real weak point was at the rear, which of course was usually inaccessible for enemy soldiers. Heavier weapons could take down Hellfire droids without much of a problem, but they had to target the droids first, which was a difficult task. To make targeting even more difficult, Hellfire droids typically remained moving unless they were explicitly ordered to slow or stop. The Hailfire droid's main weapons were a pair of missile launchers located on either side of the head. Each launcher contained 15 heat-seeking homing missiles, primarily intended for use against enemy vehicles. Additionally, a retractable anti-personnel dual laser cannon was mounted on the underside of the droid's head, intended for use against infantry. The droid's wheels could also be considered a weapon, as their inward tilt was explicitly intended to make it easier for the droids to crush groups of enemy soldiers. Between the wheels, the anti-personnel laser cannon and the missiles, the Hailfire droid was extremely effective at slaughtering enemy infantry. The droid's laser cannons had a high rate of fire and could easily mow down advancing clone troopers, while their missiles could wipe out entire platoons at a time. Of course, those rockets were put to better use against enemy armor, like Republic ATTEs. Once these missiles had locked onto a target, they would fishtail through the air, leaving thick tracks of black smoke in their wake, before making short work of whatever poor slow-moving armored vehicle they had picked out. These tanks proved incredibly effective against the IGBC's debtors, to the point where officers in the Collections and Security Division would simply take a few to an indebted world, and the planet would immediately surrender. These promising displays led the IGBC to make the Hellfire droid their main contribution to the CIS droid army, albeit in a non-exclusive agreement. These droids first saw action alongside the rest of the droid army in the first battle of Geonosis, when 4,100 of the droid tanks were deployed in response to the sudden arrival of the Grand Army of the Republic. 
Hellfire droids made a series of highly effective rapid strikes against Republic battle lines in Geonosis, destroying a number of ATTEs with their missiles. Their successes were short-lived, however. In the opening stages of the battle, the Hellfire droids sped right to the front of the Separatist battle lines to get clear shots at advancing Republic walkers, but this rendered them easy targets for incoming LAAT gunships. As Separatist air support was virtually non-existent during the First Battle of Geonosis, Republic gunships ruled the skies and made short work of most of the Confederacy's Hellfire droids. Most Hellfire droids had been destroyed by the time the Republic got its SPHAT artillery within range of the Separatist landing zones, and as a result, the SPHATs went largely unopposed during the later stages of the battle. Hailfire droids were deployed more competently after the Battle of Geonosis, but that first battle clearly highlighted one of the droids' weaknesses, its tactics. In battle, Hailfire droids preferred to charge straight toward the enemy at high speed, firing off their rockets as quickly as possible and mowing down infantry. When the droids were out of rockets, they would simply drive around plowing through platoons, if they even survived for that long, which many didn't. This had worked well enough for the droids when they were faced with poorly armed local militias, the type of enemy they had been designed to face, but these tactics fared a lot worse against the Grand Army of the Republic. Nonetheless, Hellfire droids were a common sight on the battlefield during the first four months of the Clone Wars, especially in space controlled by the intergalactic banking clan. A Separatist General Severance X regularly made use of the droids during her campaign in the first month of the conflict, while Hellfires also saw regular action during the Dark Reaper Crisis. The Confederacy's use of Hellfire droids peaked around the time of the Battle of Mutalinst, four months into the Clone Wars, in which the IGBC deployed hordes of the droids in an unsuccessful bid to protect their homeworld from the Republic. Mutalinst highlighted the problems with the Hellfire droid even more clearly than Geonosis had. On Mutalinst, the Confederacy had lost in large part because they had been unable to destroy Republic artillery in time, just like on Geonosis. The Hellfire droid was largely at fault for this. Few Hellfires made it deep enough into Republic lines to engage the SPHATs, and those that did, more often than not, had run out of missiles by the time they had gotten that far. This was by far the biggest problem with Hellfire droids. They only had 30 missiles each. Once they were gone, all the droids had were anti-infantry weapons. As a result, Hellfire droids were pretty much one-use vehicles, which made them rather useless in prolonged battles. Over the course of the next few months, the Confederacy started to use Hellfire droids less and less, with commanders often opting to bring in Trade Federation armored assault tanks instead. Hellfire droids made notable appearances in the battles on Brentel IV, Kartal, Jabim, Argonar, Mersin, and Zadja during the remaining months of 22 BBY, but after Munilinst, they were mostly used by smaller separatist units such as local planetary security forces and not in larger conflicts. At the end of 22 BBY, Hellfire droids were pulled from the front lines altogether, with the Battle of Praesitlin having been their last known appearance before this recall. The Hellfire droids set out more than two full years of the Clone Wars, while Howard Charl Engineering tried to fix their glaring flaws. This is why we never see any Hellfires in Star Wars The Clone Wars, as the whole series takes place after Praesitlin. In the meantime, the role filled by the Hellfire droid was largely filled by the AAT and the Corporate Alliance tank droid. While these tanks weren't quite as effective against ATTEs, they were much more cost effective. By the start of 19 BBY, the final year of the Clone Wars, Howard Chal had finally worked out a solution for the Hellfire droid's missile problem. Airborne refresh droids were designed to deliver a new round of missiles to Hellfires in the middle of battles, allowing the droid tanks to be more effective for longer periods. These refresh droids were hastily rushed into production and the Hellfire droid was pushed back into active duty just in time for the Outer Rim sieges. Hellfires were back on the battlefield as early as the Battle of Zagrobar, which took place during the second month of the sieges. However, they didn't really regain their original popularity with Separatist commanders until the very last month of the Clone Wars. In the Siege of Seleucami, the Battle of Megiddo and the Battle of Coruscant, Hellfire droids once more appeared in droves on the battlefield, annihilating any slow-moving enemy vehicles that stood in their way. On Coruscant, Hellfires even found another use for their missiles. On the orders of General Grievous, the Hellfire droids deployed on Coruscant turned their rockets on skyscrapers and civilian transports in the upper levels of the city, creating chaos to cover for the kidnapping of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Despite the retrofit, however, 
Hellfire droids didn't go back to being as ubiquitous as they had been at the start of the Clone Wars. Separatist officers had moved on in the two years since the Hellfire was pulled from active duty, and they weren't needed nearly as much at the end of the war as they had been at the start. The newer, heavy vehicles that the Republic had begun to deploy, like the Juggernaut tank, weren't as vulnerable to Hellfire missiles as the ATTE had been, and the other Separatist tanks were generally more suited to combat against them. The return of the Hellfire droid was also cut short by the end of the Clone Wars, following which these fearsome droid tanks were largely scrapped or commandeered by rebel groups. The Clone Wars saw both the Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems field massive new warships which had hereto been rare. Even the Republic Star Destroyers, the backbone of their rebuilt navy, were considerably larger than the go-to cruisers and heavy cruisers of past wars. But even Star Destroyers seemed small next to the Malevolence. The first flagship of General Grievous was one of the largest vessels of its time, a 5 km long dreadnought of unimaginable power. Most fans of Star Wars The Clone Wars are familiar with this ship, but few know the full history of the Malevolence, the secrets that lay within the mighty vessel, and the fatal flaw that brought it to its knees. In this video, we'll be discussing this and more. The story of the Malevolence began with a Celestan shipwright named Ruggle Schmong. For years, Schmong was enraptured with the idea of a starship powered primarily by recaptured waste heat, recycling its energy to ensure that nothing went to waste. He came up with the design for a power plant and presented it to Sorosu, the shipbuilding corporation that practically controlled Schmong's homeworld, but Sorosu executives dismissed Schmong and his ideas. His power plant, they argued, would need to be enormous and would need to regularly vent the energy it recaptured. In other words, Schmong's design would only work for a truly massive ship, either be a mining vessel or a warship. Sorosub had no interest in either. The CIS did, however. What Sorosub saw as flaws in Schmong's design were seen by separatist military leaders as assets. They would use his plant to power one of the largest warships the galaxy had ever seen, and they would solve the energy venting problem by hooking up the reactor to a pair of massive ion pulse cannons. Happy that someone was interested in his work, Schmong designed a warship around his reactor to the separatist specifications, dubbing his design a subjugator class heavy cruiser. Count Zuku commissioned two of these great dreadnoughts, naming them Malevolence and Devastation. Both were built in massive underground dry docks on Pemant, a separatist Quarren colony, by the Free DAC Volunteer Engineering Corps, a Quarren separatist organization that built warships to raise funds for insurgents on Mon Cala. The warships were built in strict secrecy, such that not even the Republic's best spies could peek inside the dry dock or learn anything about the warships. The ships were completed in late 22 BBY. The devastation was kept in reserve for months and its tale is beyond the scope of this video, but the Malevolence was deployed right away. Count Du christened it the flagship of the Confederate Navy, and General Grievous took command of the vessel. Nzuku oversaw the vessel's first few outings, however, and ordered Grievous to keep the vessel's nature a secret. Before we continue with the story of the Malevolence, let's take a quick look at the ship's specs. At 4,845 meters in length, the ship was formerly classed as a dreadnought, and at the time of its launch, it was the largest vessel in the CIS Navy. However, a lot of the malevolence was actually hollow. The vast network of reactors, ancillary power generators, power storage batteries, and heat sinks that composed Schmong's power plant ran the length of the ship, contained within a vast cavity which was necessary for the heat recapturing technology to work. The aft portion of the ship was dominated by the propulsion reactors, hyperdrive, and engine block, which contained a total of 16 huge engines. Parts of the front half were also given over to great cavities for the reactor systems, especially around the ion cannon. Maglev trains led through these large open spaces, linking the crewed decks of the ship together. For such a massive vessel, the Malevolence had a tiny crew. Due to extensive automation, only 900 droids were required to crew the vessel, according to sourcebooks. That's a little more than a tenth of the crew of a Veneta-class Star Destroyer. Most of the crew was concentrated around the vessel's bridges, of which there were three. 
The main bridge sat at the top of the aft conning tower, one of the few parts of the aft section of the ship that was actually crewed, surrounded by point defense batteries. The Malevolence also had a secondary bridge above the ion cannon overlooking the vessel's forward turbolaser batteries and a tertiary bridge on the lower section of the ship's prow. Apart from the bridges, the bulk of the Malevolence's habitable sections were located toward the fore of the ship, in front of the ion cannon, with the rest located in a narrow band just aft of the cannon. The Malevolence featured an impressive array of sensors and tractor beams, and its communication systems allowed it to establish a holonet connection with relays in real space while in hyperspace, which wasn't possible aboard most ships. It also featured an impressive array of hangars, some of which were general purpose and some reserved for specific operations. The general purpose hangars were located in the clusters aft of the ion cannon. These provided housing for visiting personal vessels and the Malevolence's pod hunters, squadrons of rocket battle droids in boarding craft that destroyed escape pods. There were several larger hangars in the lower section of the ship's prow. These were reserved for vulture droids and landing craft. A massive army of battle droids was stored in the decks between these hangars, ready to be activated and deployed. It's unknown if the Malevolence's ground armies were ever deployed, but at the very least, this dreadnought had the potential to single-handedly conquer entire planets. The Malevolence's primary weapon was its Ion Pulse Cannon, a huge superweapon capable of disabling entire flotilla of Star Wars destroyers at once. Though it appeared from the outside that the ship had two cannons, one starboard and one port, these were actually the ends of one huge ion cannon capable of sending out ion pulses to either side. Once the cannon disabled enemy vessels, the Malevolence's turbo lasers would finish them off. The Malevolence had an insane array of secondary weapons, totaling about 500 double-barreled turbo laser cannons of various sizes. Most of these cannons were located in huge artillery formations atop the vessel's bow, while many more lined the Malevolence's side. This array of turbo lasers was just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than the ship's ion cannon, capable of obliterating fleets in seconds. The Malevolence also had five-point defense laser cannon batteries, all located around the ship's primary bridge. Count Zuku intended for the Malevolence to be a psychological weapon first and foremost, a terrifying threat that would rampage across the Republic, destroying fleets and terrorizing loyalists. Zuku's plan was to create such fear of the mystery of the weapon among the Republic citizens that the Republic Navy would be forced to waste time and resources hunting the vessel, allowing the Confederacy to gain ground on other fronts. The Malevolence's rampage began in the Fu system in the Southern Core, deep in Republic space. There, Grievous ambushed a flotilla of Star Destroyers led by Jedi General Ares Noon, jamming their communications and disabling their ships with the Ion Cannon. The Malevolence then tore the Doom ships apart and sent out pod hunters to ensure there were no survivors. The attack at Fu was followed by several others, all of which followed the same pattern. As expected, Loyalists all over the Republic panicked, and the Republic Navy was tasked with hunting the weapon down. The Malevolence successfully destroyed several other Republic task forces before coming into contact with Plo Koon's fleet in the Abrogado system. Grievous destroyed Koon's Star Destroyers, but the Jedi Master himself was able to escape thanks to Anakin Skywalker, after which Plo Koon revealed the true nature of the Malevolence to the galaxy. Count Zuku was disappointed by this turn of events, but he ordered Grievous to continue his rampage across Republic space anyway. After the Battle of Abrogado, Grievous became bolder, destroying larger Republic fleet groups in more heavily trafficked systems. After Abrogado, the Malevolence destroyed fleets at Vanek, Iktor, and Vondark, chasing Republic forces up and down the Rima trade route. Grievous commanded the Malevolence to great effect, but he found, to his frustration, that the experimental power plant it was built around had a few issues. It frequently suffered from energy leaks, and firing the ion cannon sometimes caused power surges that knocked out the Malevolence's own communications, shields, and other important systems. The ship was sometimes unpredictable and not entirely stable, and Grievous considered its droid crew subpar. Still, the Malevolence proved to be even more destructive than the Separatists had hoped, and so the campaign continued. 
After wiping out a medical convoy at Rindelia, Grievous received a new assignment from Dooku. He was to use the Malevolence to destroy the Kalita Shoals medical station, wiping out the wounded clones housed there. Upon arriving in system, however, he found a squadron of Y-Wing bombers led by Anakin Skywalker waiting for him. He dispatched Vulture droids to deal with them while the Malevolence disabled and destroyed medical transports fleeing the systems, and then turned the Ion Cannon on the surviving Starfighters when the droids failed to stop Skywalker. Skywalker and several other Y-Wings survived, however, and as Grievous turned his attention to the medical station, they began an attack run against the Malevolence. They attempted to destroy the bridge, but were repulsed by the ship's defensive batteries, and ended up bombing the Ion Cannon instead. When Grievous tried to fire the damaged Ion Cannon, it misfired and destroyed itself. In a matter of moments, Ruggle Schmong's power plant went from being an asset to a liability. The destruction of the Ion Cannon caused a chain reaction that ravaged the Malevolence, though the warship remained spaceworthy. Several key systems, including the hyperdrive, were disabled by power surges caused by the cannon's destruction. The Malevolence was badly damaged, and when the Republic Navy arrived on the scene, it had no choice but to turn tail and run. The Navy gave chase, peppering the Dreadnought with turbo laser fire, but the massive vessel, damaged though it was, was able to shrug off this assault. In the end, it took an infiltration mission to bring this behemoth down. Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi boarded the Malevolence during the pursuit, hoping to prevent Grievous from escaping and to rescue Padme Amidala, who had been captured by the Dreadnought. Amidala was rescued, and Skywalker sabotaged the warship's Navi computer before the three of them fled back to the Republic fleet. When the Malevolence tried to jump to hyperspace, it flew into the dead moon of Antar instead. After just a few weeks, its rampage was over though this fearsome dreadnought certainly left its mark on the galaxy. The Malevolence was probably one of the coolest warships of the Clone Wars, in our opinion. The armored assault tank was one of the CIS's most heavily used vehicles, a mainstay of invasion armies and defense forces alike. It's a fairly iconic tank, with a simple but sleek design, and a whole lot of guns. But was it any good, you may ask? As a matter of fact, it absolutely was. The AAT was an incredibly effective war machine, and there's a reason the Confederacy used it so often. In fact, it pretty much carried Separatist ground forces. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the AAT and what made it so amazing. The armored assault tank was designed by Bactoid Armor Workshop for the Trade Federation Droid Army, shortly prior to the Battle of Naboo. Together with three other Bactoid vehicles, the STAP, the MTT, and the PAC, the AAT was intended to serve as the Droid Army's armoured complement. While the STAP filled the role of a speeder and or recon vehicle, and the other two craft served as troop transports, the AAT was a dedicated battle tank. It was designed to be able to lead the charge in ground battles, something that it ended up doing quite well. The AAT was a repulsor lift vehicle, kept aloft by heavy duty repulsor discs and coils located in the armoured nose of the craft. Due to its nature as a repulsor craft, the AAT was usable across a wide variety of terrain. Though its large front end meant that the tank needed a decent amount of space to be able to manoeuvre in. AATs weren't the fastest repulsor tanks out there, but with a top speed of 55 km per hour, they were far from sluggish. Of course, speed wasn't really something the designers at Bactoid were all that concerned about when it came to designing this tank. After all, they were looking to make a resilient, heavy-hitting frontline war machine, not a land speeder. As with the MTT, another Bactoid vehicle, the AAT had its power and communication systems located at the rear of the craft for protection. The tank was powered by a four-chambered multi-reactor onboard power plant, which was located just above the main hatch at the back of the craft. Additionally, the AAT featured a pair of secondary power generators located on either side of the main hatch, which primarily supplied power to the shovel-like lower part of the tank. Communication systems, meanwhile, were located at the back of the tank's top turret near the tank's battlefield sensors. The armored assault tank was piloted by a crew of four, a tank commander, a pilot, and two gunners. 
Originally, the crew roles on the AAT were filled by OOM battle droid commanders, OOM droid pilots, and B1 battle droids respectively. But by the time of the Clone Wars, the Confederacy had developed dedicated AAT driver droids, which were distinguished by their green armor markings. Organic crews were also able to operate AATs, and oftentimes organic commanders or tactical droids would claim the top turret of a tank to oversee the progress of a battle from. The tank's crew accessed the craft by means of an armored ramp located at the back. The pilot and the gunners were seated in the craft's main cabin. The pilot sat front and center and had control of maneuvering and presumably the tank's anti-personnel guns. AAT pilots relied on cameras and terrain sensors to pilot their craft, but if these systems failed, the main cabin did feature an armored hatch that could be opened for the pilot to see out of. The two gunners sat on either side of the pilot, operating the tank's secondary laser cannons and its artillery. The tank commander, on the other hand, sat alone in an armored turret located on the top of the tank. The commander could sit safely inside the turret and use cameras and terrain sensors for targeting purposes, or he could open a hatch on the turret's top to get a better view of the battlefield. Most organic AAT commanders preferred to keep the hatch open, despite the safety risk it posed. On either side of the main cabin's exterior, there were three handholds, intended for use by battle droids, which allowed the AAT to carry six passengers as well as its crew of four. As you might expect from its name, the armored assault tank was very heavily armored, especially at the front. The shovel-shaped nose of the craft was pretty much solid armor in many places, which allowed the AAT to ram through reinforced walls with impunity. Its armor wasn't perfect, and a single direct hit from any sort of artillery was usually enough to blow right through it, but it worked well enough. For this reason, AATs usually led the charge when the droid army deployed in force, as it was capable of soaking up a lot more damage than the flimsy B-1 battle droids it was usually deployed alongside. The AAT's primary weapon was its heavy laser cannon, which was mounted on the turret at the top of the craft. The tank commander personally managed the primary cannon, which was powerful enough to be able to punch a hole in even the heavy armor of an ATTE. The AAT also featured secondary and tertiary laser cannons. The secondary guns were a pair of repeating laser cannons attached to out-trigger arms, while the tertiary guns were two light anti-personnel laser cannons located at the front of the main cabin. Additionally, the AAT featured six launch tubes for energy shell artillery. These tubes fired physical shells that were cocooned in plasma, amplifying their destructive potential. AATs carried three types of shell, high energy shells, armor piercing shells, and bunker buster shells. High energy shells were the standard artillery used by the AAT and were fired from the outermost launch tubes. They were intended for general anti-personnel and anti-vehicular use. The middle tubes on either side of the tank fired armor piercing shells, which were slightly more powerful and intended to blow through even the toughest tank armor. The most powerful shells carried by the AAT were bunker busters, which were fired from the innermost launch tubes these powerful high explosives could utterly annihilate enemy fortifications, though their use was limited by how few the tank could carry. Tank crews were largely sparing with how much they used their artillery, as the shells couldn't be reloaded while the tank was in action. For reloading, tanks would have to be returned to a Lucra Hulk class battleship, where the entire foot section would be removed for servicing and replaced with a fully loaded one. The AAT was designed alongside the rest of the Trade Federation droid army, and so it worked well with the army's other craft. 114 of these tanks were carried aboard each C-9979 landing craft, while Lucra Hulk class battleships could carry 6,250 of them in total. They were a crucial link in the Trade Federation's war machine, serving as relays between the droid army and command. Later, during the Clone Wars, AATs were also built into basic rank structure of the CIS droid army, as a squadron of 24 tanks were required to form a battalion, and 18 required to form a vanguard. All told, the AAT was a hell of a tank. It had a very flexible mission profile, it could be effectively used in open field battles, urban warfare, anti-infantry operations, anti-vehicular operations, guard duty, 
prolonged sieges, and even reconnaissance, albeit aggressive reconnaissance. These bad boys were definitely the most effective repulsor tanks in galactic history, if not necessarily the most effective tanks overall, and they worked wonders for the Confederacy during the Clone Wars, as we'll discuss in a moment. Upon receiving its first deliveries of tanks, the Trade Federation put the first AATs through rigorous live fire testing prior to the Battle of Naboo. Armored assault tanks faced off against each other and against pirate bands in these harrowing tests, and they quickly proved to be every bit as effective as Bactoid had promised they would be. Once the rest of the army was ready, thousands of AATs were then deployed in the invasion of Naboo where they led the charge in numerous skirmishes against the Naboo and the Gungans. In the Battle of the Great Grass Plains, they were initially thwarted by the Gungans' energy shields, but once droid infantry disabled those shields during the battle, AATs began annihilating the remnants of the Gungan Grand Army, pummeling Jar Jar and his comrades with laser cannon fire and energy shells. The AATs were disabled when the droid army was shut down during the battle, but they nonetheless proved themselves effective first. Following the Battle of Naboo, Bactoid Armor Workshop publicly and dramatically disbanded for its role in arming the Trade Federation. However, unbeknownst to most of the galaxy, this was really just a cover they used to move their operations underground. Bactoid secretly continued making armored assault tanks for the Trade Federation and later for the other corporate factions that underwrote the Confederacy of Independent Systems. As a result, when the Clone Wars erupted in 22 BBY, armored assault tanks returned to the battlefield almost immediately, quickly becoming some of the most common separatist ground units. Over the course of the Clone Wars, AATs prominently appeared in battles from Thule and Christophsis to Ryloth and Geonosis to Anaxes and Felucia. Time and time again, they proved to be the saving grace of the droid army. Their heavy armor was a welcome break from the flimsiness of many other Separatist units. Their flexibility made them useful in virtually any battlefield situation, and their wide variety of powerful weapons made them a nightmare for Republic forces, even Republic forces that had ATTEs with them. For all these reasons, AATs became a favorite of Separatist commanders, especially tactical droids and organic officers that liked to make use of the tank's open-hatched main turrets. They had their weaknesses, but no crippling flaws, and their sheer utility made up for their weaknesses anyway. There was virtually no battlefield scenario in which an AAT wouldn't prove useful, and in the eternally chaotic Clone Wars, that sort of reliability was invaluable. The armored assault tank was the workhorse of the CIS droid army, and a workhorse that served its masters well. So that's our look at the armored assault tanks, one of the best war machines in the Star Wars universe. But what do you think? Are there other Clone Wars era vehicles you'd like us to take a look at? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments below.